Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us for the psychology of change in the hybrid workplace. And I am Caitlin. I'm a marketing manager at the Myers-Briggs company. And just to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping items right up front, this webinar is being recorded. So we will be sending that out along with a copy of the slides in the next few days. We will be looking at the questions that come in throughout the webinar. So please feel free to submit them as they come up in the questions box. Um, if there's any comments you have, anything you wanna share that is not necessarily a question, we would also like you to put that in the questions box and we'll be reading through that. There may be some points in this where Rachel will ask you some questions to, to answer. Please just use the questions box for that. So now I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rachel. Rachel Cubis Wilkinson. Um, she is head of US consultancy at the Myers Briggs Company and partners with clients that are dealing with change across all industries. So she is perfect for this topic. And I will hand it over to you, Rachel. Wonderful, Caitlin. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's coming in. I'm watching the numbers of people come in, just build. And that's really exciting because you're choosing to give a portion of your day and a portion of your time to us. And we certainly hope to make good on giving you some kind of value during today's session, uh, specifically talking a lot about change. So I wanna just kind of kick off with saying, you know, I was on a call recently with a client and he was talking to me about all of the different changes that they've been going through in the organization. And at one point I kind of paused and I said, how would you describe your current change efforts? How are things going? And he kind of got this look on his face of a little bit of dismay and there was a moment of quiet there and then he just kind of sighed and he said, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, it's been a lot harder than we expected it to be, it being the change process. And he said, and we're still not seeing the change buy-in or the change success that we had hoped for. And I don't know if anybody else feels like they can relate to that story. Maybe you are managing change. Maybe you're a leader who's had to pivot your team in the last 12 to 24 months in so many different ways. Maybe you're an organization that feels like you're just constrained with all kinds of external change. And what I'm hoping that today will offer you is sort of that ongoing conversation that I had with that client where we started to dig in what's making the change difficult how are you addressing the human needs of change and how can we actually help you? That's really the way I built today's webinar. So I truly hope it's gonna be helpful to you. And this is basically what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about the new change management context. What makes it different than if I was talking about change two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, we'll talk about that. And then we're also gonna talk about the psychology of change in today's context. That's the bulk of what we'll talk about today. And then I wanna give you four recommendations and insights that you can consider, are these good fits for our organization? Because I've seen them really move the needle for other organizations. And also as a sneak peek, if you're like me, you wanna know very quickly in a webinar, what is this person gonna talk about for an hour? Here is your sneak peek. We're gonna talk about uncertainty, well-being, burnout, inclusion, employee recognition, change fatigue, personality. And we're gonna talk about what on earth do these things have to do with change and what can organizations, be it somebody in HR or a leader or a manager, do about all of these things to help change. All right, I hope you're ready, let's get going. We are in what I'm calling just a new change management context. What do I mean by that? If I sort of break it down, change is not new, right? We've been talking about change as organizations for years, for decades, and we're going to continue to do so until we think that organizations have to stop changing, which I don't know when that time will actually be. But what's different is the context under which we are operating and attempting to do change. And in fact, change experts like Cotter are beginning to say things like, our understanding of change is changing. And that's because we're in something called disruptive change. Well, what is that? 
in a nutshell, disruptive change is simply a couple of things. Number one, we're facing an increased amount of change. It, are we facing more change than organizations were 5, 10, 15 years ago? I think it would be hard to quantify some of those things, but a lot of authors are saying that we are, not the least of which reasons, because there's been so many adaptations, so many external constraints and external competition that has brought about some of those changes. In addition to things like technology and mergers and acquisitions and changing client needs, the second sort of factor in disruptive change is faster speed. That means that change is coming at you, at us, at a faster speed than it has before, and it's requiring us to adapt and to change at faster speeds than we used to. There's an entire body of research out there that talks about the fact that originally organizations were built and management was designed to bring about scalability and stability and that that no longer works in the modern organization because we can't just make small incremental changes and expect to keep up. And then the third factor in disruptive change is this idea that we're having to do all of this under greater amounts of uncertainty. And when you look at any type of organization that is attempting to operate under times of disruptive change, it really presents an opportunity, a unifying opportunity for all of our organizations, no matter how big or small you are. And this is really what the change, what the opportunity is, that complex transformational change needs to happen more often at faster speeds and under greater uncertainty. Where are we on that? Unfortunately, I think the vast majority of organizations are struggling to adapt at a remotely adequate pace. Very, very interesting, sort of compelling. And we could summarize all of this, I think, in one pretty poignant quote, and here it is. We're in a time of disruptive change. That means we're in a rapid and complex changing environment. And as a result, and this is the key part, there is a growing gap a widening gap between how much change is happening, the rate of it, the complexity, and our human capacity to keep up. And that's where I really want to zero in on this presentation. You can go to so many different books and resources to download change models, but today I want to give you that sort of human capacity side, the psychology of change in today's context. When we think about something like human capacity for change, our psychology has a lot to do with it. We could look at change models that are very popular, very famous, that focus on systems and processes and methodologies. And while that's very important, they sometimes underscore or ignore the human side of change. Then there's also models that have been in existence for decades that do acknowledge the human side of change, models that are used in family counseling, grief counseling, et cetera. But those models, because they've been around for so long, also don't bring in the current context of what people are facing right now. So what I'm hoping to do today in the balance of our time is give you a little bit of both. What is the human side of change and why is it different now? What makes the way I'm talking about change different today than if I were to be doing this three years ago, five years ago or more? I want to bring some of those heightened state and factors to life for you. And this is what I want to share with you. There are certain factors that I think rise to the surface right now that are impacting our human capacity for change. And I'm going to walk through each of these uncertainty, burnout, well-being challenges and change fatigue. And what I think the invitation for you is, if you're a people manager, if you're a leader, if you're an HR, certainly put on the hat that says, am I personally experiencing any of this? But then also have an open mind to say, could it be that any of my employees are facing this and some of them may be facing it in silence? Maybe it has not been brought to your attention, right? It is possible that folks have been experiencing some of these challenges without really sharing. So let's jump right in. I'm going to basically answer the question, how are employees feeling in the current landscape? The first answer is uncertainty is playing a very major role. So if we look at what happened in the last 24 months of our, of our life, if you were in the webinar that I did in June, I talked a lot about this and go, go and listen to that. If you didn't, it's called Three Employee Support Essentials. And we talk a lot about the psychology of disruption there. But in a nutshell, if I were to quantify it or attempt to, these are the changes that we went through in the last 24 months. 
83% of us adapted to new ways of working. That means there were people managers who had never been hybrid managers before or remote managers before, and they just had to figure it out, right? Many of us faced crisis. We lost family members to COVID, and I know I'm in that boat, and I'm sorry if you're in that boat too. I know that the job market really suffered with 22 million jobs that were lost due to different changes as we were responding to this pandemic. I also know that people fell into poverty and these concerns started to become first place in the minds of many employees. We also know from research that the extended period of time where we were facing fear and trauma and stress, what it did is it raised our levels of anxiety and our levels of depression so much higher than they were pre-pandemic that our brains literally began to rewire. And some of that rewiring, I think, started to really create some biases in us around change. And I'll talk about those in just a little bit. But suffice to say, we've really been through a period of disruption that cannot be underestimated. And that disruption really sort of transferred into the labor market. We kind of kicked off last year with starting to hear from all kinds of organizations of all sizes saying, Rachel, I don't know, but it used to be easy for me to recruit people. It used to be easy for us to retain people, get top talent. I mean, we didn't even have to publish our job posts. It was sometimes just enough to post it on our website and we'd have oodles of applicants. And then the great resignation happened, the great reshifting and people in customer service roles, professional roles, they all started leaving work at roughly the same pace. And then we also found out that in a meta study conducted by Gallup of 60,000 employees, 66% of them reported, hey, I'm struggling with disengagement. And of those, 73% of them said, because I'm disengaged, I'm looking for work elsewhere. And by the end of 2021, we sort of culminated in a 20 year high of a quit rate that left over 10 million jobs open with fewer people to actually fill those jobs. Now, let's bring us 12 months into the future. Where are we now? What are organizations and employees still experiencing? I can tell you pretty much not a day goes by that I don't speak with a client that tells me competition is still stiff. The labor market is still tighter than ever. We're struggling to retain people. We're struggling with attrition, hiring and selection. Sometimes we put in a job offer on Friday to somebody and by Sunday, they've taken a job somewhere else. And that's because the research backs that up. There are still two open jobs as of last month for every unemployed person, unemployed person. And part of that is because there was a study that was done of everybody who changed their jobs in 2021, what's helped? What's good about that change that you made? And at least 50% of people say that the change was a good one because they pivoted to an organization that embraced flexibility of work location, of work time, did not demand that people come back into the office, did not demand a certain nine to five schedule. And that gave the person control to have improvement of their work-life balance. And I don't know about you, but I've heard from numerous organizations where the people who left kept in contact with the people at the former organization and took one, two, three, or four of them with them to that new organization. And there's been a residual loss of people. If you kind of flip over to the employee side, some of the challenges that employees have been facing is that their managers and their leaders have been desperately trying to return to pre-pandemic normal, despite the fact that 50% of employees say, you know what, if I have to be forced to go back into the office, I'm gonna have to find another job. And another 50% of employees say that losing flexibility of work location and work time is their second greatest fear, second only to concerns about COVID. So if you really think about it, there's a lot of people that are still struggling with flexibility and whether they get that benefit or not. And then I think on top of it, there's another source of uncertainty that we're facing recently, and that's these mounting concerns about the economy. A fourth of people are worried that their pay is gonna be reduced, 
a third of people are worried that their hours are going to be cut or that they're now going to have to work even harder than they've already been working just to prove their worth at the organization. And then roughly half of the people are worried about this compendium of factors that says, am I not going to get a raise, even though inflation is so much higher? Are, is there going to be a second round of layoffs at my organization and I'm going to have 20% more work because of the people who have left. And then I found this very interesting in this study. 62% of employees are saying that the uncertainty level is so high right now that they're expecting stress and tension to be at an all time high at work and to make work harder. Let's ask the question again, how are employees feeling in the current landscape? Burnout is playing a major role. So take a look at this. This is an amazing visual. This is a representation of when somebody goes to Google and searches the word burnout, whether from work or from life. I want you to take a look at where these lines started about 15, 16 years ago and where they are now in 2022. We are at an all time high for people who are identifying as experiencing burnout. And this data made me very curious and I started to ask the question, who, who is experiencing burnout? Can we look at subsets of people? And what I ended up finding out is that as of 2022, as much as 70% of people would say that they are experiencing burnout. And you know what, that holds true, regardless of your age group, baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, all of them, burnout is up. And it also holds regardless of your work location, remote workers, in-person workers, hybrid workers, they're all experiencing burnout. And the, the real challenge of burnout here is that while the organization is also constrained financially, you're facing your own challenges of inflation, you're facing retention issues, a stiffer labor market, well-being and stress and uncertainty are pretty costly for the organization. $190 billion a year, they also affect work quality. Nine out of every 10 employees say, I'm experiencing stress at work and it's affecting the quality of my work. And if I'm experiencing stress or burnout on any consistent basis, guess what? I'm three times more likely to have to look for work elsewhere or things like absenteeism go up. Let's ask the question again, how are employees feeling in the current landscape. And the third factor I want to talk to you about is challenges of well-being. I don't know if you know this, but we're going through something that I'm just calling the well-being gap, where fewer than one out of four employees, fewer than 25% of US employees agree that their organization cares about their well-being. And the interesting thing is that's the lowest percentage in nearly one decade. Now, I was on a phone call with a client, different client, and I, I appreciate the honesty of the question because the leader stopped me and the leader said, hang on, you know, I've been, I've been a, a C-suite leader for many, many decades. There was a time that we never even talked about employee well-being in the workplace. Is it really my responsibility as the leader of the organization to worry and to address concerns about employee well-being? And while I appreciated the honesty, I very quickly responded back, well, let's, let's look. Let's look at what the cost would be if you don't focus on employee well-being. And we actually started to unpack the fact that when employees are not reporting positive well-being at your organization, it leads to an increasing set of problems. It starts with fatigue and stress and demotivation. It then moves into lower morale and disengagement, which we know are heavily costly to organizations. It then moves into absenteeism, silent quitting, or actual attrition. And so really, it kind of, it, it's kind of one of those things where if you look at the screen and you say, okay, how many of you have faced this in the last one to two years? You faced fatigue, you faced stress, demotivation, burnout, any of these things. How many of you have witnessed staff members, colleagues, or peers of yours who are in this bucket? the more organizations don't respond to this, the harder it's going to become for us to truly steward organizations in a way that they will be as effective as possible for people, for the bottom line, and for our stakeholders. Let's look at one more. 
I'm going to ask the question one more time. How are employees feeling in the current landscape? And the factor that I want to highlight is change fatigue. I don't know if you know this, but according to a 2022 survey, 71% of employees say they use the word, I am overwhelmed by the amount of change that has taken place at my job in the last 12 to 24 months. In addition to that, 83% of workers say that, are, that they're suffering from change fatigue and that the organization that they work for has not given them the necessary tools and resources that they need to be able to adapt. However, they're very concerned because 78% of employees say, I know more change is coming. And I mentioned here that, that our sort of mood and different things that we're experiencing can inform some biases. So we were recently in a workshop where we started to address confirmation bias and negativity bias. And what was at the root of it is that employees were so fatigued from change that they started to interpret any change communication from the organization, no matter how high up it came from, no matter how detailed it was, how transparent it was, they were anticipating negativity from that. They were anticipating this change is gonna cost me something. I'm gonna lose something from this process. And it was also confirming their confirmation bias where they were basically saying, see, this is what I expected would happen and this is exactly what happened. And I wanna pause here and I wanna hear from as many of you that are out there, what would you say, how might psychological stressors, and please type your answer in the question box, how might psychological stressors impact our disposition to change? What would you say? How might psychological stressors impact our disposition to change? And I'm starting to see a few of them come in and they are wonderful. Isabel, refusal to change, absolutely. Dr. Cheryl, I see becoming more rigid based on fear. Yeah, nailed it. That is a really nice one that you're sharing there. It would lessen our ability to handle change, says Melissa. Caitlin, are you seeing anything else of interest that you want to point out? I'm seeing some great ones. I think you really hit it, making it resistant and having fear just be the, the first reaction, fight or flight response, more narrow. Totally. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. You guys are 100% spot on. Our disposition to change erodes and becomes a barrier to change management at the organization because change resistance goes up. And here's what the research says. Change resistance will increase any time any one of these factors are present. I'm about to show you what those factors are, and I want you to ask yourself, how many of them have been present at your organization in the last 12 to 24 months? Take a look. Has there been any sense by employees that there's a loss of control, a loss of routine, destabilization, sudden unimposed changes, too many things changing at once, more work landing on my plate, past resentment of the way that the organization handled change the last time, excess uncertainty. Any time one of these factors is present, you can count on the fact that change resistance will go up. And that's because change interferes with our autonomy. It's disruptive and it makes us feel as though we have lost control. So, I hope that the last 20 minutes or so have just elucidated for you in a tiny way that when we started the presentation with saying there is an erosion, a growing gap between how we have to keep up with disruptive change and what our human capacity is, I hope that you've learned a little bit more about how human capacity is being affected right now. At the same time, I want to give you some things that you can actually do about it because you could go out right now and you could Google some change management models and you could look at things that focus on systems and processes and tasks, and those are wonderful. But the intangible factors of the psychological state of an employee, the emotional state, how motivated an employee is, employee morale, buy-in, those intangibles are actually what will also derail change success at the organization. And I hope that I'm making at least a compelling enough case that now more than ever, we need to focus on the human side of change. So how can we do that? Let me give you a couple of recommendations. Recommendation number one, 
ramp up your employee well-being strategies. In this study done by the Burson organization, they found out that companies that focus on employee well-being, they see positive outcomes for the business everywhere. Everything from exceeding financial targets to exceeding client uh, customer requests and delighting customers. Interestingly, though, there's also a correlation between investing in employee well-being and the employee feeling more engaged and more able to adapt to change. So what does that tell me is it tells me that employee well-being is a lever for change success. And here are some tips of how to boost employee well-being at your organization that we've helped organizations do. The first two, you know, raising awareness, talking about mental health. I, I have worked with many organizations where we're doing a workshop on employee well-being and employees feel almost like they don't have the permission, even self-imposed, that they don't have the permission to think about or worry about their well-being. They sort of check their well-being at the door and they think that's me at home and this is me at work. Well, that's, that's really difficult, right? Because you might be carrying some very difficult challenges and normalizing discussions about well-being will help break down some of those barriers. If you're in a position to, that third bullet offering flexibility of work location and work time, Forbes called it the most empowering benefit that you could give an employee right now. More than compensation, more than many other things, give them back the power to have a little bit more control over their work-life balance by giving them flexibility of when and where they work. And then this fourth one here, provide training. I've seen this be transformative for organizations. We've built training around raising employee self-awareness about well-being and how their personal well-being is impacted, understanding how you get stressed out and how that's different for you than it is for me. I might be stressed out when I have lack of autonomy. You might be stressed out when there's not enough structure and detail letting you know what to do because stressors are not always universal. So you have to learn what those stressors are. And then we have to actually train folks how to build resiliency. And what I love about this is Northwestern Medicine just said, practicing resiliency helps us improve our well-being. What does that mean is that our well-being is not a static number. Our resiliency is not a static number. You can actually build it and grow it by giving people the training and the tools. I also think developing human-centered leaders is critical. If you didn't catch that webinar in June, we talked a lot about how employees right now want to work for leaders with empathy and emotional intelligence. Let me show you in the research why this is so critical. So there was a study that was done that looked at 24 of the proven strategies for employee well-being that, de that demonstrated a positive impact on people in the workplace and performance. They looked at 24 of these, and these are 24 that are proven to work. And what they found is that the, of the top three, two of them had a disproportionately positive impact on employee well-being. So what does that mean? It means if you're looking for where to start with employee well-being, these are the two that you really need to do because they are disproportionately positive impacts to employee well-being. And they are human-centered leaders and managers and focusing on positive mental health. And all of these, what I find fascinating is they are more impactful than all of the other factors combined. Things like commitment to the environment, things like opportunities for workplace connections, meaningful rewards, fair and equitable compensation. So if you're an organization that says, you know what, I'm a small organization or we just don't have the budget for employee well-being, this is a really good place then for you to start because you know other people have gone before you and they've proven that this is an effective driver of employee well-being. All right, let's look at the second one, recommendation number two. The first one was focus on employee well-being. Now I wanna say, let's ramp up employee recognition. This one is a fascinating one to me. And what I wanna first tell you is, what is the impact of an employee recognition culture where that recognition is meaningful? And then we'll talk about what is meaningful employee recognition. So if you do it right, Meaningful employee recognition has so many amazing benefits. 
I literally dove into multiple studies to pull this out. It reduces burnout, boosts feelings of happiness, creates optimism and enthusiasm in employees. It supports a deep sense of belonging and inclusion. When you truly focus on creating a culture of meaningful employee recognition, employee engagement goes up, retention goes up, job performance, productivity, they all go up. So it's a pretty compelling thing for us to at least say, what on earth is meaningful employee recognition? And the challenge is that typically when we think of employee recognition, we sort of think of programs that we create. Sometimes, you know, HR will help us, they'll give us a little bit of budget, and there's an employee recognition program for, you know, maybe we're gonna recognize your years of service at the organization. Maybe we're gonna give you a $25 Amazon gift card for that job that you did recently. The challenge with some of those strategies is that meaningful employee recognition, the kind that drives the outcomes I just showed you, according to the study, it has to, in order to achieve desired impact, it has to be meaningful to each and every person individually. And that needle moves from one person to the next. And I think here, let me offer you the fact that personality can actually help you. You don't have to be familiar with the Myers-Briggs, but I'll show you a little bit of an example. So when I was a people manager and I was trying to focus on employee recognition, I had a direct report. We'll call her Danielle just to sort of protect her identity. And what we found out about Danielle over time is we went through a Myers-Briggs workshop and I discovered that she had a thinking preference in Myers-Briggs and that the way Danielle wanted me to recognize her is she wanted to work on a project for weeks or months. And at the end of the project, when she showcased her work, that's when she wanted recognition for a job well done. She thrived on that sense of you hit the bullseye, you did it on time, on scope, on budget, and you really did a good job. And what's interesting is because I also have that Myers-Briggs personality style, I sort of gave that feedback to Danielle pretty naturally because I thought I, that's the feedback I want, so let me give that feedback to my direct reports. And Danielle lit up and loved it. But I also had another direct report, we'll call her Maya, and she has Myers-Briggs type preferences in her personality for feeling. And the way Maya wanted to be recognized is that while she was working on a project, maybe it would take days or weeks or months, she wanted me to show her appreciation during the project and she wanted it for a specific set of things. She wanted me to recognize the effort that she was putting into the project and the personal contribution that she was making, the values that she was upholding and bringing to that project, totally different. And for the first few years of me managing Maya, I did a terrible disservice to her because I was offering recognition the way Danielle wanted it, not the way Maya actually wanted it. And because of that, I didn't achieve meaningful recognition for all of the employees. And you can tell from that sort of anecdote that leaders are pretty critical to this thing, right? It's not just an HR job, employee recognition. Leaders and managers are the linchpin. If you're going to create a culture of meaningful recognition, you have to provide tools and trainings to your manager. And here's what I think would be really helpful. This is what we've done and it's really proven effective. Teach your leaders and managers how to give and receive feedback. I can't tell you how many managers I've worked with that have been managers and, and leaders for a year, a month, 10 years, and they've never been given training on how to actually give and receive feedback. The second thing is help them learn what each employee wants. Does this employee want to be recognized for a job well done? Does this other employee want to be appreciated for their effort, for the values that they bring to the organization and to every project that they work on? And then very importantly, help the leader have the epiphany that I had. How does your personality preference as a leader bias the way you recognize employees? Because we tend to recognize what we value. And sometimes we recognize only what we know, traits and characteristics that maybe we bring to the workplace. And those can create really kind of blinders and biases for leaders. So really focus in on that as much as you can. 
Okay, let's look at recommendation number three, possibly my favorite one, and that's this in a sentence. Inclusion is a driver for change management and change success. So I'm suggesting ramp up inclusive leadership at your organization. And it turns out that the research actually is starting to pick up on this. So Cotter described it this way this year. He said, we're moving into a time where change is so disruptive, we need to mobilize meaningful action. And that requires that we leave behind the antiquated methodology of just the elite few, and we move towards the diverse many. There is no longer a space for just a few strategic leaders of the company being in a conference room and directing all of the strategic you know, actions and initiatives of the organization and then communicating those to other people as objectives that just need to be met. Not unless you want to be met with the resistance that comes with imposed change. We did a presentation on psychology of change many years ago and we dove into that concept. How much more motivation do you have during times of change when you're a part of driving the change versus when it is imposed on you? And it turns out that the research is proving this. Those who feel included will help create the change in addition to their normal responsibilities. Now, did you know that employees feeling included is also kind of a leadership thing? So up to 70% of the difference of whether or not an employee feels included at the organization rests solely on the person's direct manager, their direct leader. And everything else that the organization does is that other 30%. So here again, leaders are really the linchpin. What does that mean? That means that if you have a commitment to inclusion organizationally, you're committed to DE&I, you've been seeing it under the umbrella of DE&I, maybe you haven't seen it under the umbrella of change success, but if you're committed to it at the top levels of leadership, but every single manager and leader down the line isn't giving that legs and isn't sort of singing the same tune, you don't have that inclusive workplace culture yet. So I wanna show you an example. What does inclusive leadership look like during times of change? And the way that I'm doing this is, I've had the, the real privilege to work with an outstanding organization in the last year, year and a half, and we've been doing numerous workshops with all levels of leadership. And one of the things that I've asked people to do is, reflect in your career what are things that leaders have done that left an impression on you that made you feel included and what have they conversely done that maybe made you feel excluded even if they did it unintentionally they had no idea and here's some of what they've come up with so if you're driving change and your leaders are operating like this we would consider that they're not being very inclusive right these are the behaviors a leader that doesn't show interest or seeks out the perspective of others. A leader that you can pretty much count on is gonna make decisions on their own in the name of swiftness and quick decision-making as much as possible, rather than gaining input and collaboration. They might also behave in a way that when you present them with an alternative idea or vision or process, they're not really open to it. They're not really open-minded about divergent ideas. They might also be leaders who keep a very tight inner circle. The people who are really in the know, they're the ones that sort of know all of the motivation behind the change, but everybody else just sort of knows the objectives and kind of following forward. And then another key behavior that our workshop participants came up with is the fact that leaders who made them feel excluded also did not demonstrate that they were in tune with their own biases. So if I'm a leader and I'm leading other people through change and I don't in some way evidence to my team that I'm aware of my own limitations, my own biases, my own vulnerabilities, and that I'm curious to, to say how might they be impacting the way I'm driving change, that comes across as exclusionary. It erodes the psychological safety of the team and it makes people feel like that leader should not be questioned. What is the effect that people have? They feel demotivated. 
devalued. They feel excluded. I've had employees who say, I literally had to find a job elsewhere. And then I've had employees that say, you know what? I love my job. I want to stay. But this type of behavior by my leaders is making me feel more uncertain. So we know that uncertainty and burnout and well-being heighten as challenges, and then those become challenges for the organization as well. And then I've also heard employees who sort of take this approach of, well, if I'm not involved in the change, then you can pretty much count on my resistance because I'm not there for the fun part of the change, the motivating part of the change, all of the strategic discussions that you're having in that tight inner circle. I'm not a part of them. So how can you expect me to sort of move forward and own that change the way that you might feel that you can own it as a leader? All right, let's flip this. What did workshop participants say leaders did during times of change that really left a positive impression on them and came up with positive benefits? It's sort of like the flip side, right? It's that they sought input from other people. They listened authentically. Whenever they could, they shared problem solving, they shared decision making. It wasn't always a solo decision. When they were presented with divergent information, they weren't tied to their own way of doing things. They gave every idea, no matter how divergent, sort of its time to be explicated, to be reasonable, to be implemented. They also say that something that goes a long way is when the leader elicits their ideas, their input, and when the goal of the leader in communication is not just to tell you, here's the objectives you now carry out, the goal is ownership. How do you help others own the change on a personal basis where they are empowered to drive the change every single day? Then the effects of that type of leader become really powerful. People become motivated. They're valued. They're heard. They're respected. They're able to speak up. Harvard Business Review came out with a study a couple of years ago. What is the power of inclusion in the workplace? It leads to people wanting to speak up, go the extra mile, collaborate and lift organizational performance. So I think this is one of my favorite ones because truly inclusion is sort of that driver for change management and change success. So if you're looking for some tips for where to get started, certainly get some buy-in from your top level leaders that we're gonna move away from this elite few and move to a diverse many approach for the wonderful benefits of inclusion, but then bring it down to your managers in a practical way. What do your leaders need to be able to do? You have to give them tools and training to know how to create and sustain an inclusive culture. Give your leaders tools and training for how to leverage diversity of thought, how to boost change success and performance, and very importantly, help them have those aha moments that I did where you understand your own limitations, your own biases, and how I might be driving really hard during times of change for something, and it's peppered from my personality, and I may not realize that's not as motivating to other people as it is to, to me, and that I get curious about what is motivating right, to other people which sort of leads me to that fourth and final recommendation. And here, I'm gonna actually ask you to come along with me in an exercise in just a moment. So you'll wanna sort of put away any other screens that you're working on and, and, and come in tune with me in the next minute or so. But what this recommendation is about is during times of change, I have found it very powerful if you can leverage personality assessments because they give staff and leaders a shared common language to be able to talk about individual needs and differences. And I feel like there's tools that all employees need, and these are some of those. If you're going through radical change at your organization, any type of significant change, give your team members these tools. Every staffer needs to be able to understand their personal needs during times of change. What makes change motivating for you is not what makes it motivating for me and give me the tools to advocate because where the organization might miss it in a top-down approach, let's help people manage up. Let's help people advocate. Let's also give people tools around communicating better with others because communication tends to really become uh, eroded right during times of change. And then let's give people that ability to practice their own well-being and their own resiliency, identifying what their own stressors are. And then for leaders, leaders have a whole unique set of needs. Leaders need to understand that there is no one size fits all approach. 
diverse employees have diverse needs during times of change. What are they? What can I do about them? They need those tools. And then they need tools to become more human centered tools around emotional intelligence, empathy, employee well-being, inclusion, and helping them understand these things are all interconnected to what you really, really want, which is happy, engaged, productive employees, right, that have high levels of well-being. So what I want to do is I want to take us through a little bit of an exercise. I don't know if you've ever taken the Myers-Briggs before, but some of you might recognize what we're about to do, but come along the journey with me, I think it'll be uh, pretty fun. If we were trying to help you understand what your needs are during times of change so that you can advocate for them, and we were trying to help you as a leader understand your direct reports, we might approach it with a personality assessment. So for example, pick one of the two that I'm gonna show you on the screen. Let's imagine that you're learning about a change for the very first time. What would you say is the preference that you want first and most. Are you like Danielle, who is energized by interacting with others, getting together, meeting live, brainstorming, talking about the change? She becomes very sort of outwardly expressive, action-oriented, wants to brainstorm and talk things through? Or are you more like Maya, who wants to learn about the change and then wants to kind of go off and retreat a little bit, have an opportunity to reflect, she might be seen as a little bit more contained and she prefers to be told about things sort of in advance before talking about them in a public setting, before open discussion, before taking action, because she really wants the latitude to be able to work her ideas out through reflection. So given the choice, would you be more like Danielle or more like Maya? Take a look there. And feel free to let us know in the questions, right? We'll finding that very interesting. I see some of those coming in. So those of you who are familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality assessment, you probably guessed it. Danielle has an extroversion preference. Maya has an introversion preference. But what's powerful about this is if Danielle finds that out and if Maya finds that out, they can advocate for their own needs during times of change. If I'm their manager and I find this out, I can know who I'm sort of naturally tailored to support in a, my go-to process and who I might need to flex my style to a little bit. And if we know this about all of the employees in the team or the organization, we can adapt our organizational tactics to help both of these groups, right? So if you only do company-wide meetings with open forums and live discussions, that's probably gonna favor Danielle. It's not gonna favor Maya. If you only do, we're gonna communicate about a change via email, here it is, and there's no opportunity to talk about the change, brainstorm the change, or express ideas, that might be great for Maya, not so great for Danielle, right? So think about how this could help you in your organization. Let's do one more. Again, you're learning about a change. What type of information do you prefer first and most? Are you like a direct report that I had named Steve who says, give me the facts. I want the what, where, when, and who. I want you to tell me why are we even changing? What's broken specifically? Because I need that evidence to feel motivated to even change. And I also need you to tell me not only what are we practically changing, but what's my role specifically? Paint a picture for me very clearly about what my role might be. Or are you like my other direct report, Joe, who would get very excited about a change and would say, give me the big picture, give me the why, give me the overall thing we're shooting for. What's the end game? How does it connect with other things at the organization? How does it energize my thinking about future possibilities? Go ahead and pick one there. Would you say you're more like Steve or would you say you're more like Joe? And I'm giving folks just a moment. I see some coming in there that are offering their thoughts. And once again, you don't need to know this, and this certainly isn't a replacement for the Myers-Briggs assessment in its totality, but Steve has a sensing preference and Joe has a intuition preference. Now, what I wanna show you is something really cool that we get to do in some workshops is we don't just look at preferences on their own, we look at them combined. So somebody like Danielle, who has a preference for extroversion and sensing, I could always count on her 
to be in a team meeting and want to jump into the change immediately. She was very action oriented, likes to make change happen, was really focused on tangible results. I could always count on Steve to keep the team grounded. He liked to remind us of things we've tried in the past that didn't work. He liked us to be very evidence driven. He wanted to keep things real and concrete. I could always count on Joe to sort of have that excitement about change. He was almost like excited change for its, for its own sake. And he always kind of felt like we don't have to work out the details right now. We can work them, them out as we go. And if something is not working, we'll just pause, revise, and keep on going to that big vision that we have. And then I could always count on Maya to sort of bring a little bit more introspection to say, yes, I'm excited about the change, but I wanted to fit my own vision and a certain set of principles. Let me go off and think through it. Let me go off and sort of tinker with it. And you may not have this exact team like I did, but take a look at these statistics. What, this, what these percentages are is how many of this type of person there is on the Myers-Briggs globally. 26.8% are like Danielle, 40.7% introvers introversion and sensing like Steve. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it stands to reason that your organization has every one of these folks at the organization. What does that mean? It means that if I'm built as a leader and I'm a little bit more like Maya, am I sort of leaning into my leadership approach so much that I'm really favoring people like myself, like Maya, but I'm doing a disservice to all the other folks who need something from me that I don't even realize I'm not providing, right? So not only do people have different needs during times of change, but the leader needs to have self-awareness of how they're different. And I wanna show you this, imagine a leadership team, imagine that these guys are leading a startup, right? They're individual powerhouses in their own respect. They're one leadership team, but guess what? They're going through a big change. They, the four of them are aligned on the change, but they lead so very, very differently. Tom, for example, here, he comes across to his employees as drawing on expertise and knowledge, having high standards, a real hands-off leadership style where you kind of empower other people to do things, likes to analyze information and is very flexible and adaptable, can be fluid in the moment. And that's how he leads people. Then you might have somebody like Claire here who has a different type of personality preference and she's described as being all about input, bringing in the viewpoints of others. She's described as a coaching and encouraging manager who's really flexible and resourceful. Then you might have somebody like Judy, and she's described as she really structures decisions. She makes very quick decisions, takes quick action. Boy, is she clear on the vision. She has a clear and consistent position, and she comes across as very confident. Here's the change. Here's what we're going for. Here's how we're going to mobilize people to get there. And then you might have a totally different personality style here that is sort of value oriented, wants to include other people, wants to really drive consensus. They're described as being loyal leaders who are really in tune to the needs of other people. And I think the challenge that we face as organizations and as leaders is we think that aligning our leadership team in times of change is just having a unified vision for the change. And then we tend to forget about how the fact that once you are one, two, three, four organizational levels removed from those people that are making the strategic decisions, my vantage point from change is really dependent on my people manager and the way they're leading me through that change. In this example, I'm like Judy. I have that TJ personality style. I come across as quick decisions, quick structure, very clear vision. I know what we're going for and let's mobilize people. But guess what? That creates a vulnerability where I may not build consensus. I may not seek anywhere near as much input as I need to. And because of it, I may not bring as many people along as I think I'm bringing along because I may place too much emphasis on clarity of information and structuring and where we're going and nowhere near enough emphasis on bringing in that input and helping people own the change personally. So when we come back and we round out this recommendation during times of change, leverage personality assessments like the Myers-Briggs, like the FIRO to do a couple of things, to raise employee self-awareness, 
to help employees and leaders understand and advocate for their own needs during times of change. We looked at a simple example today, but we could have gotten into communication decision-making, how do you advocate for your needs during those times? And then you can also, armed with that knowledge, you can adapt your communication plans, your rollout strategies, so that they're not just focusing on systems and processes, but they're also focusing on the human side of change. And then I think I said it pretty clearly, but leaders are the linchpin for so many things. I don't like to blame leaders for things. I like to acknowledge the powerful position that they have, and that's that they broker the day-to-day -day employee experience. What I think about my organization, whether or not I feel included, boy, that rests so heavily on my direct people manager. And I'm lucky to have a very good one. I hope you are too. I want to pause there and I wanna say, Caitlin, would you walk us through some resources that we're gonna offer folks in addition to today's PowerPoint? And then let's see if maybe we have a question or two we could look at. Absolutely. So yes, if you do have any questions, now is the time to get those submitted. Um, I will just quickly go over a couple of things that we'll be sending in the next couple of days. So um, a lot of the great information that Rachel covered will be just in this webinar, but we do have a couple of additional assets that we have put on a landing page for you. So we'll be sending that out with um, some that landing page has th some research it has a couple of blog articles it also has more information about the mbti virtual live series as well as the firo and the mbti tools um, like rachel mentioned those are great things to help you navigate this um, this time in particular so with that we also have the psychology of change in the hybrid workplace ebook that's available to download on that page um, but like I said, we will send all of that out to you. So it'll be in your inbox and you won't have to look for it. And now I'm just going to go over and see what questions we might have. Um, looking at the time, we may not have time for every question, but we will respond via email. And you can always send questions to our email if you have some that pop up a little bit later. So the first... I've seen some good questions, yeah. by the way. And Barbara, you are getting a copy of these of the slide deck, the whole thing. And uh, Dr. Cheryl, as a fellow um, person with that personality preference that you shared, thank you so much for that wonderful comment that this has been a very helpful presentation for you. What questions can we address? Sorry, Caitlin, what were you seeing? Um, so the first question that I that I have on here is. Um, does this information that you've shared apply in a global workplace as well as a US-based workplace? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's pretty compelling evidence that change is, is increasing on a global scale and also that the human factors that we looked at of change, uncertainty, burnout, well-being, many of those being fueled by the pandemic, fueled by the economy, all factors that really do um, sort of have a global type of impact for sure. Awesome. Okay, and then I do see another one. Um, could you share the studies you referenced or are they on the slide deck? They are on the slide deck. So every single slide deck where there's a statistic or study, just uh, Google that author and the date and you'll find it pretty easily. Fair warning though, it'll probably take you two weeks of solid work to go through all of the studies <laughs> that I went through today. So, um, so you might wanna pace yourself. Perfect. Um, and yes, we will send those out. So uh, you'll have all of that information um, in the slide deck as well. So uh, I think one of the other questions and this I unfortunately don't know the answer to, um, which hopefully you do. How does MBTI relate to the diffusion of innovation theory? I am not familiar with that theory. I almost wish we could unmute you and let you tell us what that theory actually <laughs> is. I'm, you've piqued my curiosity though, and I'm going to go read about it as soon as this presentation is over. Perfect, yeah, I'm not sure what it was either, so it was a long shot, but we will get back to you via email on that one, Whitney. Um, okay, so, I think that is all the time that we have for today for questions. So just thank you so much again for joining us and thank you, Rachel.
for giving us this great presentation. It was very, very great. I love the information. Um, and that is everything from us. So if you have any other questions that pop up, you can go ahead and send an email to us and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you everybody for carving out time from your day. We loved having you. Bye everyone.